hopefully, okay, great. Okay, cool. Good. Okay. Um, well, uh, hi everyone. My name is Nishant, and uh, I'm currently a rising junior at Brown University. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, it's an honor to be presenting in front of all of you today, so thanks for inviting me, and thanks to the organizers for putting all of this on. So uh, before I get started, I'd like to give a brief prelude to the talk. So um, this talk is intended to be a, a high-level sort of tech overview of some of the areas of robotics and AI that I care about. If you want more technical detail, I'm happy to discuss more afterwards. So uh, I'm going to start off with um, some motivation for the work and get into where we are right now uh, in terms of the state of robotics and intelligent machines, uh, and then move on to some of the recent research work that's being done at Brown and the labs that I'm part of, and also some thoughts about the future. OK, so let's dive in. So why should we care about robots? Well, I think there's a pretty obvious uh, practical use for these machines. Um, we could disrupt and hopefully help a lot of fields ranging from transportation to healthcare and agriculture. But also, as humans, we've sort of been dreaming of robots in science fiction for a while now. Like Rosie over here, we'd really like robots that can help us you know, do our dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks that we'd rather not do. And I think a quote from Rodney Brooks is particularly relevant here, um, where he says he hopes robots help us do this, and that he hopes people, robots will allow people to rise to better things. So these could really be, intelligent robots like this could really be sort of the greatest tool that humankind has ever invented. So there's extreme sort of practical use. But also something this community probably cares a lot more about is uh, the idea that we might be able to use robots to, um, as a window to get at the artificial intelligence problem. So typically our computers are these disembodied agents, you know, that crunch information in sort of a world of bits. Um, however, uh, Robots uh, are able to like sense and interact with the physical world. And so there is a group of people, such as Ronnie Brooks himself, who believe in this idea of embodied intelligence, which essentially sa says that like, to achieve true intelligence, you have to be able to interact with the physical world. You have to like, work with the world of atoms. Uh, and, and robots let us do this in an interesting way. And whether or not you particularly subscribe to this idea, I think that the challenges of robotics, such as like estimating your state or like, you know, walking or doing things in the real world are interesting. And if we do build an artificial general intelligence, then it should be able to work on robots. So robotics is intellectually interesting as well. So I'm going to move on to, to some modern robots that you guys may have seen or heard about. Start off with the Curiosity rover. Um, this is, you know, a giant robot that's on Mars right now performing experiments. It's mostly driven by humans, but, you know, it can do a couple autonomous things so long as it completely senses its environment. Um, also, these are probably more common. These are uh, robots that, you know, have very precise movements and work in our factories, assembling our cars. Something also that can be thought of as robots are like planes and ships, because a lot of the times these are driven by autopilot, which is essentially some amount of intelligence. So we can think of these as like large sort of autonomous, trying to act autonomous intelligent machines. But I bring all this up because I want to ask a question, which is what do all of these have in common? And I'm sure they have a lot of things in common, but specifically I want to highlight the fact that they typically operate in very structured environments. What I mean by that is environments that we as humans can like make assumptions about, right? So with the planes, for example, we can assume that there's not going to be a giant obstacle that comes out of nowhere. And we can assume that our plane sort of knows about all the other planes in the sky and is able to plan for it. And, you know, because they operate in structured environments, humans are able to hand design models, right? So we're able to, to program in our assumption, design something, and have the robot work, like, dependent on the structure, depending on all these assumptions, right? But when we talk about sort of robots that we'd like to build for the real world to work in our offices and homes, well, really, the real world is kind of messy. It's pretty unstructured. Um, fun fact, this is my dorm room from last year. Um, and, and that's kind of unfortunate. And dealing with this is, is a rather hard problem. But there's been some progress on. 
uh, this field, specifically robot learning. So, so robot learning is really something that was born out of recent advances in machine learning, specifically deep learning and reinforcement learning. And instead of you know, explicitly programming in models, we, we, use, we leverage data of robots doing tasks to learn these on the fly and operate in these unstructured environments. And, and you can see here that these robots are able to do some rather you know, impressive real world tasks. And this was not programmed before. So this was completely learned. And that's pretty cool, but you know, robots aren't you know, in our homes and offices yet, so, so clearly there's a couple problems. And specifically, there's a problem of sample inefficiency. So to give you some data, um, state-of-the-art methods typically require 30 minutes of human demonstrations per task. So that's like, if you want to teach your robot to pour water from one cup into another cup, that's 30 minutes. Now, if you want your robots to do all the things sort of a human can do, You'll probably be sitting there for multiple months. Um, and the other issue is generalization. So you guys might have noticed some green screens in those videos. Um, those are there for a reason, because if you change the background even a little bit, um, these learning algorithms get really confused because they think it's a new environment. And, and both of these problems really, um, yeah, so, so the, the, what a robot learns for one task doesn't really generalize to completely new tasks. And, these really point to the problem of a lack of large data sets. So with deep learning specifically, you know, we've seen a lot of success when we have a lot of data. Case in point, ImageNet, one of the most successful deep learning models, had tens of thousands of labeled data images. But for robots, where are we really going to get labeled data of robots doing things unless humans really sit there and do it for hours and hours? So, so this is kind of a problem, but there might be some ways to get about to get around it and one well it's also interesting because this is where we are currently i think it's kind of a paradoxical place so with intelligence we're able to play chess pretty well we can beat the best humans at chess we can also beat the best humans at go and as of recently we can even play online very complicated games that require sort of collaboration like dota 2. but ask us to move those chess pieces or do simple things like put a box on um, a table and we, we get some pretty interesting results. Um, specifically, we fail horribly. So um, <laughs> this is kind of an instance of something that's been observed called Moravec's paradox. And basically what this says is that, you know, it's comparatively easy for us to do things that humans find really hard. But ask us to do anything that a human finds easy, like walking, and, you know, it's very, very difficult. So we live in an age where I think more of X paradox is especially relevant, and this is kind of difficult. So, so what can we do? Well, the point of this talk is to maybe introduce this idea that designing algorithms that are both intelligent and collaborative from the ground up may help us because these sort of are interrelated at, in this sort of high-level way. Specifically, the more intelligent our, robot, our uh, algorithms are, the more collaborative we can be because, you know, we have the robots are more intelligent, we don't have to tell them exactly what they need to do. And the more collaborative we are, the more we can sort of leverage learning from humans and other robots to improve our intelligence. So, so what does this look like in practice? Well, I want to highlight uh, a specific work. So uh, there's uh, a work that we've been doing called parameterized imitation learning. And uh, this really leans on some imitation learning. OK. So imitation learning exists is where you show your robot what you want it to do. So here we have a human show, using virtual reality to control a robot and show it a task. And then, you know, we do it multiple times, specifically 30-ish minutes. And then our robot sort of learns to do it on its own with the object placed in a new place. And that's really cool. Typically, the easiest way we do this is by supervised learning, right? So we essentially say, hey, robot, we're going to give you expert trajectories. And your job is to copy those trajectories exactly. We're going to formulate a loss function based on those trajectories. So every time you deviate from that, we're going to penalize you. And we form this as a supervised learning problem. But this approach has a couple problems. Specifically, you know, for every new task, we need to train it like from scratch, scratch, scratch once again. So we need to train a new skill. And this may involve providing 30 minutes of new data every single time, even if the tasks are kind of related. So specifically, let's say we wanted to train a robot to press buttons. Fairly simple, right? 
If I wanted to train it to press button three, that's 20 minutes, another button 20 minutes, another 20 minutes, and so on. And this really doesn't make too much sense, right? It makes, it would, as a human, you know, you learn to press one button and then sort of you can generalize that anywhere because you know that like the only thing you're varying is where you're pressing the button. So what if we sort of introduce this idea for robots? So specifically, for tasks that are like from the same general family, what if we input some parameters to our learning algorithms that correspond to a specific target within the task, right? So hopefully we can vary our task depending on the input parameter. So this looks something like this. So on the bottom left, you'll see a, a button board there. And let's say we train the robot to press those four different buttons, right? But we also give it a certain parameterization. So we say, hey, this button is 2, 2. The next button is 1, 1. The other one is 0, 1, and then 3, 3. And then we give it this knowledge, we train this, and then we say, hey, I want you to press 2, 1, which you've never seen before. But maybe it's able to do it. And the interesting thing about this, uh, this whole idea, is that it can be done rather simply. So, so what you see here is a, a state-of-the-art uh, neural network for performing robot learning. And Really, the only thing that we added to this to you know, get this idea working is that thing right there. It's a simple concatenation in one of the fully connected layers that allows us to you know, input a target parameter. And you know, this works rather well in practice. So here's a, I apologize for maybe how rough this video is. This is ongoing research. But here's, we said the goal was press that button at the top right and the robot is sort of moving there and able to do that. Now, we change it to a button it's never seen before, right? But it's able to use the same skill and understand that there's just a different target location and move there. And it's doing it kind of slowly, but it eventually goes there and hits the button. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but there's a slight catch here. I sort of slipped something by you maybe a little bit kind of fast. One might think this method works um, you know, without any human input, right? The robot just completely learns. But those, those parameters there, they're hand specified by the human designer, right? So instead of giving it numbers like this, what if I had said that's button A, the other one's button B, the third one's button C, and the fourth one's button D, go press button E, right? The robot really has no idea what the correlation between A, B, C, D is. But it has an idea what the correlation between these numbers are. So really, this relies on the human in this process being able to specify good numbers and good input parameters. And that's, that doesn't feel as great, because we sort of want our robot to learn everything from scratch. But that's also not too bad of a problem, because the specification is pretty easy. and this doing this really allows us to be much more sample efficient and generalize really well. So this is sort of an example of leaning on humans to collaborate with them and then make a more intelligent algorithm. Now, I want to show some work that does this in a much more overt way, much more leans on human collaboration. So let's say we want our robot to do something, a task like this. Put away all the wine glasses, which you see there on the right. Now, here's a catch. Let's say I wanted to do it without any training data, zero, right? So the answer to that is, well, we're be probably better off just doing the task ourselves because the only real method available to do this with zero training data is to program it yourself. So you write, as a human designer, a program that will move forward like X inches, pick up the glass, and then put it in the thing. Obviously, there's some problems with that. that that's pretty time consuming. You know, It requires someone with expert knowledge. And you know, even if you moved the glasses slightly or you asked it to do a new task, we, we have no idea. Yeah, the, the, the method does not work. So we're kind of confused. But here's some related work that we might be able to lean on. And that's mixed reality for human-robot interaction. And by mixed reality here, I mean specifically te technologies like the HoloLens and Magic Leap 1 that allow us to place, as humans, real-world holograms that in, in an environment that robots can interact with. And this has been used in prior work. So for example, it's been used to sort of visualize the motion a robot is about to do and stop it if it's going to be, do something bad. It's also been used to actually program robots to do things. So leaning on this work is an interesting idea. 
So for any task that you as a human would sort of want a robot to do, the human really knows all the things about the task that's relevant to doing the task. So humans sort of know things. Um, and the mixed reality holograms, they sort of allow the human and robot to communicate in a very intuitive way. So what if we, allow, we use the holograms to allow humans to directly specify the task relevant information to the robots, right? Maybe that way we don't need to provide any training data. Well, it turns out you can do this and you can build this sort of end-to-end -end pipeline. So specifically here, what's happening is the human uses holograms to annotate object positions and shapes and tell the robots how to do various actions. This goes into a planner and then the robot you know, does planning and then executes an action such as putting away those wine glasses. Now, if there's a failure, the robot is able to propagate that back to the human and um, the human may be able to correct it. So this is a little abstract. So let me show you some videos from some experiments. So this is a first person view from inside our hologram interface of a person showing a robot how to do a specific task. And with no training data whatsoever, we're able to accomplish it. But it's not only a simple pick and place task. The exact same pipeline works with another completely different task, like turning up. And you can see here that the robot is failing. And it's failing specifically because it's unable to accurately estimate the position of the light switch. But the human is able to help it every single time. And through this, we're able to do much more complicated things in new environments immediately, such as turning off a light, uh, a light switch and turning off a faucet. So some takeaways from this work in general. Well, having a human in the loop and depending on them can enable us to do tasks that are otherwise not possible. Of course, this might not generalize well, right? So in that example I just showed, if you had moved the soda can or the light switch or whatever, it's, you know, the human would have to go back in and re-specify it. But here's an interesting thing. So using that approach, we can actually collect the large data sets or the training data that we might need to train state-of-the-art robot learning methods. So, so all the data that we did in this mixed reality work that we, where we showed the robot how to do various tasks, that could form a training set that we could train state-of-the-art methods on and allow robots to do cooler things. Some more general takeaways from sort of all this work in general, including the button pressing work, is that so robot learning in general has attempted to move completely away from structure, right? We don't want to depend on any structure. But, you know, I think it's important to, that we should leverage whatever structure we do have, right? So it's not necessarily that we should completely assume unstructured environments, but using a little bit of structure can go a long way. Specifically, our parameterization work assumes that the tasks are related, so it assumes that structure. It's not going to work for like, oh, I'm going to teach you to open a door, and then I'm going to ask you to generalize to opening a window. You know, those tasks are like too different to, be, to work well. So we should, we should uh, lean on some structure when we can. We also really don't necessarily have to learn everything in the environment, right? So leveraging human knowledge is, is pretty useful, provided that leveraging that knowledge is easy. You know, if the human has to go in and type in a complicated program for us to like give our knowledge to robots, that's complicated. But if we can use things like mixed reality, then you know, it takes less than a second to be able to correct it or give it a new task. And um, we can and should lean on existing solutions. Uh, and, and not necessarily attempt to learn everything completely from scratch. And specifically as sort of a general takeaway in the title of this talk is that if we design intelligent and collaborative algorithms from the ground up, it could be useful to ta tackle these issues of sample efficiency and generalizability. I'm not going to claim it's the answer, but you know, it's showed some promise. So. I want to talk a little bit about a future direction that I think I'm kind of uh, excited about. And this is uh, sort of uh, incorporating something called robotic priors. Uh, and specifically, this leans on the idea of like, we really don't have to learn everything. So, you know, we really don't have to completely like come into the world knowing nothing and then just learn everything. We can hand code prior knowledge so long as this knowledge is pretty general in the world. And well, here's an interesting thing that I, I, I was definitely surprised by, but machine learning and artificial intelligence have actually leaned on priors for a pretty long time now. Specifically, 
In machine learning, we typically assume that the simplest hypothesis is the best one. So the moment we can fit something with a certain amount of accuracy, well, the simplest one is the best explanation. So that's a version of something called Occam's razor. We assume uh, independently, identically distributed independent data, and we assume that if we keep doing our gradient descent, you know, at some point we're going to hit something that is a good optimum. In AI, we typically assume that our tasks are somewhat hierarchical, so we can break it down in a hierarchical way. Various parts of the world are independent, and then there's some symmetry that we might be able to leverage. So given that we already sort of do this for machine learning and artificial intelligence, can we lean on more priors? So with robots, we have sort of an extra extra information that we're operating in the physical world, right? We're not operating in any possible universe. We're operating in this very specific universe with these very specific physics. So can we lean on general aspects of the physical world, such as the laws of physics? Well, it turns out that you actually can. And there's been some recent work from a PhD student named Viko Janczkowski. Unfortunately, for lack of time, I can't really go too into that or show some show extra videos. But I would encourage you, to, you guys to check out his papers and his PhD thesis. They're some of the best things I've read, and I think this uh, direction is very exciting. So I kind of want to end this talk uh, with a picture and um, sort of uh, a quote that um, gets me out of bed every morning and like makes me excited to continue working in this field. And that's this. So. Hopefully someday, if we keep working on these algorithms and these machines, we might be able to get something like this. Um, a generally intelligent collaborative robot that is able to operate robustly in almost any environment, regardless of structure, unstructure, clutter, or anything. And something like this could be incredibly powerful and may just be able to change the world for the better. Thank you very much, and a special thanks to all the amazing people at Brown that made this possible. I'll take any questions if you guys have them. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a great question. So let's see if I can go back to some videos. Uh, so you'll notice something interesting here. So the tasks are all two step. So there's one step where the robot does one thing. So, you know, that's step one. It finishes, it succeeds, and that's step two. You look at this as well, the other tasks. Um, so, moving up to the light switch is step one, and then it begins failing on step two. And the moment it's able to successfully complete step two, it's done. So, we assume that all tasks that we're going to be given are two step. There's no reason you, can gen you can't generalize this method to like end step tasks. But you know, in this work, we assume two-step tasks. And it turns out you can do a fairly large amount of different tasks with two steps. Thanks. OK, thank you. <laughs>